Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, just gonna briefly talk to you about Python. It's there's a lot going on in Python, so definitely can't cover everything, but hopefully give you a bird's eye view so you can uh, know a little bit more about it. So we'll talk about just a brief introduction, give a little bit of a history of Python, overview of Python, benefits of Python, and then the most important part of Python, all the libraries. Uh, we'll go ahead and discuss those. We'll talk a little bit about what Jupyter Notebooks are and other IDs, and then also discuss Django, Flask, and have a Q&A at the end. So I can't see the questions and answers right now, but go ahead and just uh, type them to the box and then at the end I can check those out and answer any questions you have. So just as a brief introduction, um, my name is Jose Portilla. I'm the head of data science at Perry and Data Inc. and I'm an instructor and trainer for programming and data science. So usually uh, when I teach Python it's in terms of things such as uh, financial analysis or data science. So let's talk about just a very brief history of Python. Uh, Python's an open source scripting language, which is nice because that means you don't have to pay for it. Um, and it was developed by a man named Guido Van Rossum. He worked at Google initially and then now works at Dropbox. And it was developed by him in the 1990s. It was named after the Monty Python comedy group, which he was a big fan of, which is how it gets its name. And it's currently on version 3.5 and 2.7. And if you want to get the official uh, documentation or information, the, the official website is www. Uh, w.python.org. So basically, there are these two versions of Python, the 2.7 and 3.5, and actually 3.6 is going to be coming out. A lot of times for beginners, there's some confusion as far as what are the differences between 2.7 and 3.5. Uh, basically, what happened in a historical context, Python was being developed um, in this 2.x uh, versioning system, and there were some changes that would have broken to since they uh, wanted to make those changes, they basically made a new branch off and called it 3. And currently, everyone, if you're developing a new project or just learning off Python, you should technically be learning 3. But to make it clear, these two versions are actually extremely similar to each other. There's very few differences as far as what's going on uh, to a user. Under the hood, there's more changes going on. but to someone who's just learning how to program or learning how to use Python, they're very similar. Um, so don't let that confuse you as far as uh, what version you should learn. If you're just learning off, you should learn 3.5 or 3.6, which is going to be coming out soon. But they're so, so similar that if you know one, you basically already know the other. So let's talk about who uses Python. Um, this is just a very short list of a ton and ton of people that use Python. Uh, all the major companies probably in the tech sector use Python. Companies such as Yahoo, Google, Facebook, Disney Animation, uh, NASA's big Python user, Red Hat, IBM, and many, many more sites such as Reddit are run on Python. And their sources actually, uh, or their source code is all open source. So if you want to figure out more of how they use Python at reddit.com, you can actually go to their GitHub repository and see all their code, which is interesting. So let's talk about why you would choose Python. So Python has a huge standard library, and what that means is it already has what's known as, uh, in other languages, batteries included. And basically what that means is even in the standard library, you have things such as a mathematics library, things to do uh, calculations such as uh, sine or cosine. So that's already built into Python, things like how to read a text file. All these packages are included in the standard library. And what's really nice about this is there's really nice quality documentation for the standard library. So if you ever want to look something up, you don't have to be Googling or looking at Stack Overflow for a long time. You can just go to the documentation, and it's all pretty well laid out for you there. And on top of just the standard library, uh, which is the phrase that people use, the batteries included, that has all these packages for you, there's actually a ton of third-party modules as well. So if you want to do something with Python, more likely than not, someone else has already tried to do this and has open sourced a package to do it. So that can be anything from working with Excel files with Python, automating PowerPoints with Python, sending emails with Python. All of those kind of things are available to you um, as third-party modules that you can download for free. There's also an emphasis on code readability, and that's probably one of Python's biggest strengths. Python makes use of something called white space, 
In other languages, a lot of times you're using brackets to hold code blocks together. But Python is really unique in that it uses indentation and white space to make sure your code's organized. And if you don't have this organization, your code just won't run. So that really pushes you to write, write really readable code. And that saves a lot of development time. So developer's time is usually much more expensive than computational time. It's really easy to just buy a new computer. It's not so easy to hire a whole new developer. So the fact that Python really reduces development time um, is really great. And there's a broad range of uses for Python, as I mentioned, anything from like a little shell script to entire enterprise web applications to scientific uses. uses. And, and the best part of all, it's very easy to learn really quickly. And I personally think that actually um, the Python community, as an open source community, has one of the best and most welcoming communities online. So if you ever feel lost, everyone's really open um, on the forums and online, ready to help you out. And I think that stems mostly from this last bullet point that it's really easy for beginners to pick up. So a lot of the Python community still remembers how it was as a beginner and is more than willing to help you out. So it's a very friendly community uh, compared to other languages, which is a big bonus. So let's talk about Python performance, which is a lot of times what some people uh, try to get on top of Python for. So it can't run as fast as something like uh, C++ and it's, since it's an interpreted language. However, you should know that there are a lot of libraries for Python that are written to have direct bindings to C or even Fortran, which are languages that run really, really fast. So you can take advantage of these specific libraries, and we'll show you one later on called NumPy, that saves a lot of developer time. And it's usually, again, much more valuable than computation time. So what you can do is actually harness and leverage the power of Python's quick scripting ability, use one of these libraries, and have it bind to either C or Fortran to run your operations um, almost as fast as if you had taken all the time to write in some of these original uh, faster languages. So let's talk about um, some Python libraries. So Python has hundreds of third-party open source libraries, and we're going to discuss some of the most useful and popular ones. And this is not an exhaustive list. There are a ton of these. These are just some of my favorites that hopefully uh, are the most obvious for what use cases you may find. So NumPy is the one I actually was just talking about. So NumPy is officially known as a package for scientific computing of Python. It has this powerful n-dimensional array object, really sophisticated broadcasting functions, and most importantly, it has tools for integrating C, C++, and Fortran code. So it runs extremely fast. Um, Python, since it's an interpreted language, it usually runs a little slower than some of these other languages, but if you just use uh, these NumPy packages, it can run um, almost the same speed as some of these uh, extremely fast languages. Now this is mostly for scientific computing, so it also includes things such as linear algebra, uh, Fourier transforms, random number capabilities, etc. And this is on top of Python's own uh, mathematics uh, standard library packaging. Then one of my favorite packages is called Pandas. And Pandas is basically the Excel for Python. It's a really, really useful library. Um, so Pandas is an open source library providing high performance, easy to use data structures and data analysis tools for the Python programming language. And you can think of it as similar to the R programming languages or a very powerful version of Excel with added functionality. And whoops, sorry. Um, basically, Pandas allows you to open up Excel files, CSV files, um, TSV, uh, connect with a SQL database, any sort of tabular data format. Pandas is a library that can open that up for you. But what's really nice about Pandas and what makes it so powerful is you have the capability of Pandas to open files that would usually be too big for Excel to open. So if you have a four gigabyte CSV file, something like that would usually uh, crash Excel depending on how much RAM you have on your computer. But Pandas can open that up uh, no problem. And there's even uh, additional libraries for Pandas such as Dask which allow you to open up files that are larger than memory and RAM. So it will actually break them up into convenient sizes and you can then just iterate uh, over those chunks essentially. So if you have some 20 gigabyte file that for some reason is not in a SQL database, you just have it on your computer and you're trying to figure out how to open it, how to do calculations on it, Pandas with some additional libraries actually has the capability to break that up into chunks and then just iterate over those chunks. Um, there's no other program, really, that would be able to open up a file like that that's larger than your actual RAM. 
Um, and if you're familiar with the R programming language, uh, you can basically think of it as Pandas's R for Python. Uh, it's, it's a really useful library. Uh, was invented by this guy called Wes McKinney for financial analysis. Pandas, since it was built for the financial industry, uh, has the capabilities to read uh, stock information directly off a Google or Yahoo API. Um, really, really powerful tool and one of my favorites. And it's built off of NumPy, so it runs just as fast as all that NumPy stuff. Um, data visualization is also one of Python's uh, huge strengths. Uh, Python plotting. Python has a ton of plotting libraries. There's things such as matplotlib for static plots. Uh, that was created by uh, John Hunter, who, if you've ever heard of a language called MATLAB, he basically wanted to create MATLAB's visualization capabilities for Python. So what he ended up doing was creating this library called matplotlib, free, open source, and you can create static plots with matplotlib. And as you might be sensing a theme that basically a lot of Python developers want something that's available in another language, they just end up building it in Python and then open sourcing it and making it available to everyone. So you can take advantage of all their hard work and look like a genius for it, which is nice. Uh, Seaborn is another library for plotting. It focuses more on statistical visualizations, uh, really pretty looking plots and graphs. And then you can have Plotly, which is a open source library for cross-platform interactive visualization, which is really awesome. Basically, you can create a visualization in Python and uh, set it up as an HTML file or export it to Excel or MATLAB or R using this Plotly library. It's cross-platform. It's interactive, which means you can do really cool stuff like uh, have your mouse over points and then it'll report back information do geographical plotting, a uh, really powerful library, uh, really awesome stuff going on there. So let's talk about web development with Python. So there's basically two web development frameworks. There's Django and there's Flask. So Django is probably the more popular one. It's a high-level Python web framework that encourages rapid development and clean pragmatic design. Uh, it's very fast and really important security is a high priority. So even though it's open source, um, security is something that's uh, very important to Django. So if you ever uh, feel uncomfortable using something that's open source as a web framework, uh, Django is extremely popular. It's used by a ton of websites, things such as, I believe Pinterest uh, still might run on Django, um, or at least use it in the past. And it's also very scalable. So Django has all the tools you need if you want to ever do web development and build a website uh, that runs on Python. So you can take advantage of that fast development time of uh, Django and Python. And then, sorry, whoops. And then Flask is basically, uh, you can think of it almost like a little brother to Django. It's what's known as a micro framework. So it doesn't include all the bells and whistles of Django, but if you ever want to build your own, uh, maybe blog or something or mini site, uh, Flask is a nice alternative to that. So let's talk about uh, big data APIs. So Python is beginning more and more popular as an API for a lot of these big data technologies that are coming out. So Python has APIs uh, for many libraries. Uh, Spark and Hadoop both have APIs for Python. So if you ever uh, dealt with big data, you've probably heard of uh, Hadoop as a distributed system, and you've probably heard of Spark uh, since it runs about 100 times faster than Hadoop. And there's also MySQL, PostgreSQL, et cetera. All these SQL databases and all these SQL engines have API libraries for Python. And Python's become this really big player in uh, not just data science, but data engineering because of all these APIs and all these uh, connections to a lot of these big data libraries, or even just uh, more, I guess, normal uh, SQL type databases. But basically, what this allows you to do is it allows you to quickly prototype data applications with Python and not have to deal with the frustrations of some of these um, original languages, such as Hadoop or uh, Spark, or sometimes, uh, since they're not written in Python to begin with, they can be sometimes hard to work with, but you can use your Python API in order to quickly develop applications with these technologies in Python. So really powerful stuff there, and you basically get the best of both worlds. Fast development time, and then the power of these uh, new big data technologies.